Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Kevin O'Brien. I'm president of Santa Clara University, and I'm delighted to welcome you to really a very special evening. This is our inaugural program in uh, a series that we're calling SCU Listens and Learns, Race, Reflection, and Renewal. The series will continue throughout the academic year and together and with the help of our guest presenters, we will reflect on these questions. How can I make the world a more just and gentle and humane place? How can I contribute to the need for renewal and reconciliation in my community and in my world? Now, as a Jesuit university, we strive to make connections between faith and justice, between education and serving the common good. In the tradition of core personalis, which means care for each person, we strive to develop all parts of the person in mind and in body and in spirit. And a Jesuit education engages all of who we are as we seek to understand the needs of the world, particularly the needs of the most vulnerable and dispossessed. This engagement makes demands on us to think and to feel more deeply and to act concretely for the good of others. In a sense, to labor for justice in all we do. All of these values we see reflected in the lives and the work of our inaugural guests this evening, Ms. Dolores Huerta and Mr. Luis Valdez. Now our guests are not new to Santa Clara, uh, Lu Luis received an honorary doctorate from Santa Clara in 1992 and returned some years back for Mexican Revolution in the Arts. And Dolores has been to our campus several times over the years, including as a Santa Clara parent. I was especially taken with the, the the wise simplicity of one comment she made on a visit to our campus when she said simply, if all of us are working together, we can really change our world. So to offer further introductions, it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anna Sapayo, professor and chair of our Department of Ethnic Studies here at Santa Clara and an alumna of Santa Clara who I just learned at her graduation in 1992, who was the graduate speaker? But Luis Valdez. Thank you, Anna, for uh, facilitating our conversation tonight. Thank you so much, Father O'Brien, both for your kind words and also for your leadership during this really extraordinary time for all of us. It's truly an honor and a privilege to serve as moderator tonight with two living legends, both Loris Huerta and Luis Valdez. Their names are well known to all of us and their work literally serves as the basis of movies, and entire university courses. However, I would be remiss if I didn't share with you some of their remarkable achievements as they provide a reminder to all of us, especially during this challenging time, of what's possible. Dolores Huerta is arguably best known for co-founding the National Farm Workers Association with Cesar Chavez in 1962, an association that would evolve into the UFW, United Farm Workers Movement, that changed the history of labor organizing, of activism across the country, and helped to launch the Chicano movement. Dolores' skills as a tenacious and principled organizer are legendary and extend as much to grassroots organizing as they do to modern electoral politics. As the principal legislative advocate for the UFW, Dolores became one of the UFW's most visible spokespersons. Robert F. Kennedy acknowledged her help in winning the 1968 California Democratic presidential primary months before he was shot in Los Angeles. Dolores has not only embodied a lifelong commitment to racial and economic justice, she's also been a lifelong advocate for gender justice, challenging gender discrimination inside and outside political movements, and through the, her Dolores Worth the Foundation becoming a central figure in the push to register and mobilize Latina, Latino, Latinx power, and build capacity for Latina seeking political office. There's a long list of awards that commemorate Dolores' storied careers, among them the Eleanor Roosevelt Human Rights Award from President Clinton in 1998, the Kern County Women of the Year Award given by the California State Legislature, the Otley Award from the Mexican government, um, and, and nine honorary doctorates from universities throughout the United States. 
She was inducted to the California Hall of Fame in March of 2013. And in 2012, President Obama bestowed Dolores with the most prestigious award, the Presidential Medal of Freeman, the highest civilian award in the United States. At 90, Dolores Huerta continues to work tirelessly developing leaders and advocating for working poor women and children and, and supporting equality and defending and advancing racial and gender justice. Luis Valdez is the founder and artistic director of El Teatro Campesino and one of the most important and influential American playwrights living today. His internationally renowned Obi award-winning theater company was founded by Luis in 1965 in the heat of the United Farm Workers struggle and the Great Delano Grape Strike in California Central Valley. His involvement with the UFW and the early Chicano movement left an indelible mark that remained embodied in all his work from his early actos, short plays written to encourage campesinos to leave fields and join the UFW, to the masterpiece of American theater that is Zoot Suit the play that re-examines two of the darkest moments in the racialized history of LA, the Sleepy Lagoon trial of 1942 and the Zoot Suit riots of 1943 in a richly complicated and generative work that became the first Chicano play on Broadway and the first Chicano major feature film. It was definitely the first Chicano feature film I had ever seen when I saw it. Luis has also numerous feature film and television credits to his theater career, including among others, the box office hit film La Bamba, Cisco Kid and Corrido's Tales of Passion and Revolution. In addition to an extraordinary career as a playwright, author, founder, and artistic director, Luis has served as a lifelong educator and taught at UC Berkeley, at Santa Cruz, Fresno State University, and was one of the founding professors of CSU Monterey Bay. Like Dolores, he has a number of honorary doctorates from several universities, including the University of South Florida, as Father O'Brien mentioned from our own Santa Clara University, where I was very proud to witness that uh, occurrence, and his alma mater, San Jose State University. There are also a number of storied awards that accompany um, Luis's career. Let me simply say that there are not enough words to capture the magnitude of both Dolores and Luis's talents, their work, their anima, and the impact that these two extraordinary people have had on the world and all of us here at Santa Clara University. On behalf of the, what I imagine are hundreds, if not thousands of people watching tonight, let me say thank you to both of you for your work, uh, for your inspiration, for your hope, but also for joining us on this important occasion. We're so grateful to have you with us. Um, and so I thank you um, and welcome you tonight. And I also wanna remind everyone, you have the opportunity to talk with Dolores and Luis by virtue of submitting questions either in Facebook or in YouTube in the chat function, if you are so able. <laughs> so with that, with that introduction, um, I wanna pose a few questions just as a kind of starter, and then we can also turn to the chat if that's okay for both of you. Sure, that's fine. Thank mm -hmm. you, Anna. Okay, so there is so much in both of your careers that lends itself to the moment we're all in today. So let me start a bit by asking you to reflect on your past, right? You both had a rich and generative history organizing within marginalized communities of color, particularly in the face of openly repressive political and economic regimes. In short, there are a lot of parallels between your long history of work with UFW, with the Chicano movement, with labor organizing, and the push for political change and racial justice we're facing right now. So reflecting a bit on that past, what, what lessons can you draw from your own history, from your own work that can help us in this moment we're in today? Dolores, please. <laughs> oh, well, uh, I think the, the main lesson that we can learn is that, uh, and, and this is of course my mantra, is the way that we change things is by organizing. We know that in California, uh, when they passed Proposition 187, uh, which was aimed directly against undocumented immigrants, and I think that was the point where the Latino community in California finally woke up and said, we've got to do something. And, and we saw a great resurgence of that, uh, you know, Latinos getting registered to vote and voting. And, and it's interesting because even today, uh, you know, we've got Proposition 16 on the ballot and that we have, that was to bring back affirmative action, which we had uh, before Pete Wilson took it away. And it was interesting that Pete Wilson's statue was taken down <laughs> just recently in front of the Hilton Hotel. 
And so I think that the lessons uh, that, that we have learned in the past is that we, number one, that uh, we don't have to take all of this attacks on our community and that we can definitely, uh, you know, we can we can strike back and do it in a nonviolent way uh, by, again, voting, registering to vote, uh, organizing. And at the, I think at the same time, and I don't know if Lisa agrees with me or not, but I think that we've uh, kind of uh, seen a little uh, stalling, I think, in the movement that we were making. A lot of it, of course, went to the political arena. And uh, somehow, when all of this was happening, uh, you know, there were some really bad laws that were passed, like the three strikes law, you know, the uh, the building up of the uh, uh, criminal just, just the criminal unjust, unjust system against uh, black and brown and mass incarceration. And, uh, and then also the, the demise of the labor movement in, in, in total, where we have seen that it, it has been harder for uh, labor unions to organize. So in a way, uh, it, we're kind of at a, at a point right now, I think where we kind of have to, uh, to just uh, have another uh, lurch forward, you know, because I think we somehow got stuck somewhere along the way. I think we were making a, a, lot, a lot of movement, a lot of advancements. And uh, some of, of course, some of it was an education, but in terms of the, uh, how shall I put it? I think the movement, I, I guess with the exception of the dreamers, uh, because the dreamers, as we know, I call them the vanguard of, of the immigrant rights movement. So it's, it looks like we made a really big push and then we kind of got stalled a little bit. And now I think uh, now where we're at, now we're going to see another resurgence going forward. That was a lot. Well, <laughs> Sorry. Well, it, that's fine. It, uh, to add to that, uh, well, there's so many different ways. First, I'd like to express my appreciation to Dolores and, and to Cesar, you know, Cesar Chavez, for giving me the opportunity to, to join the Huelga and the union movement in Delano, where I was born. I was born in a labor camp, uh, in the, right in the middle of Delano, right by the, labor, by the railroad tracks in 1940. And the following year, across the street from the labor camp where I was born, uh, a family came from Arizona and moved into one of the two shacks that uh, belonged to one of my tias. And it turns out it was the Chavez family, and it was Caesar and, and Richard. So, I mean, our destinies somehow have, uh, have always been intertwined. Dolores grew up in Stockton, which is the other side of the southern part of the San Joaquin, the, uh, the northern part of the San Joaquin Valley. It's all one great big valley, though. We all share a common... Uh, destiny, you know, and it's really the south of California. It was racist, it was uh, feudal, it, it was oppressive, it still is to this very day. Uh, and so uh, when I was able to go to Delano, I was uh, very grateful to and join a movement that was dynamic and that was already underway, uh, headed not just by Cesar Chavez, you know, a farm worker, but Dolores Huerta, uh, uh, an emblem, you know, of, of female leadership. Uh, it, it was wonderful to follow. She was the first woman general, if I've often said, that I followed into battle. And, and I think that that was a lesson for me. But the lesson that came out of the Teatro Campesino has to do with creativity. You know, and I mean, I've been studying the Mayans my whole life, and uh, I believe in the wave principle, you know. They represented it as a rattlesnake, you know, with the coils of the rattle uh, 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 undulating. And the thing is that history comes and goes. It goes up and it goes down. Nothing is a straight line. Life is dynamic. I think that ultimately we have made tremendous progress in my lifetime. I have seen uh, that uh, the racism that I was born into uh, has been challenged. People like Dolores and Cesar, but people all over the world, the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, stood up against this evil that exists to, to this very day. But it is reactionary. The people want to go back to a past that... Uh, a reality that no longer exists. America is plunging forward into the 21st century. We are talking on a medium that is part of the evolution of the 21st century. We're at a pivotal moment in American history. A hundred years ago, airplanes were coming in, automobiles were coming in, telephones were coming in, the world was changing. Of course, it led to World War I and eventually World War II. We are facing utter horror also in this century but it is horror in 21st century terms. One of them is COVID-19. I think this is the beginning of a lot of epidemics, pandemics that we're gonna see around the world and our way of living has to change. We can no longer uh, drive around and fly around the world using up you know, fossil fuels the way that we have been doing, destroying the planet as we go in the name of capitalism, you know, in the name of, of profit and fun. 
We need to stand up to this, and we are all part of a wave. I look to the young as part of the new wave that is sweeping into this new century. It requires confrontation. It requires courage. It requires patience. But I think this is the value then of having leaders like Dolores and Cesar in our history that inspire us and keep us going and inspire new generations to fight for their rights and for human rights all over the world. Thank you both so much. I just, you know, just these little nuggets have been, uh, are so, pieces, uh, you know, are so um, inspiring and certainly so, um, so motivating in this really dark time. I, I wanna ask you a bit more about this season of campaigns and elections. Um, and particularly, there's a lot of reports about various forms of voter suppression. We are seeing historic forms of voter suppression aimed specifically at Latino and African-American communities, everything from purging voting polls to restrictive voter ID requirements. Um, and they're aimed not only at Blacks and Latinos, but young people in this country, right? Now we're learning about disinformation campaigns aimed specifically, again, at Black, at Latino, and young people circulating in things like social media that are openly advocating not voting, that are openly advocating just um, a withdrawal from political life. The argument being everything is corrupted, everything is, is problematic, there are no pure politics, and so there's, you might as well wash your hands of this. And, and this is a whole different type of um, suppression, and I'm wondering how you respond to this, to the students, to the people watching, reading, digesting, those kinds of messages. How, how do you combat that? How do you respond to that? I think that's, uh, that's what really bothers me a lot. It's like the immorality is normal. It's like um, when I was talking about that somehow the things of uh, and the pushback has been so severe and and in a way of kind of like you wake up all of a sudden you find out how did all this happen well i'm talking about the mass incarceration for instance of of young black and brown people uh, a school system that is so rigged right now that it makes it very difficult for black and brown children to be able to know that they're going to have a chance of, of going to college uh when you have uh when like voter suppression, which is really get in the way of people voting, which is against the law, and yet you have government officials doing this and getting away with it. And all of a sudden, hey, you know, it, it becomes a political game instead of saying that it's, uh, but this is this is wrong and, and it's supposed to be against the law to interfere with anybody's right to vote. And yet people at the highest levels are, are, are doing this. Uh, and the other thing that really bothers me, I think we have like this mass ignorance in our society right now. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes down to our educational system uh, where, uh, you know, we don't have ethnic studies uh, at kindergarten level, for instance, you know, so we can uh, fight against the racism, the sexism, the homophobia that exists in our society. And even the environment, you know, science is, de science is debatable, really? I mean, that was, <laughs> that was way, way many centuries ago at some point. You know, science was not debatable. Now it is debatable, you know, whether it's science or not science. So uh, these are, I think, the things that really bother me. And then you see people that are somehow um, accepting uh, accepting all, all of these isms that I'm talking about and, and, and not only accepting them, but promoting them and then uh, and hating people that don't agree with them and then becoming violent uh, behind, behind those ideas. And... Uh, and uh, you know the things like bother me is like the this young man who got into a car and drove 200 miles to El Paso, Texas, to kill people because they were Mexicans, or the people who killed Jews in in synagogues or killed people because they're they're black or because they're Muslims, you know th this kind of uh, and it, and it seems like somehow it doesn't really people are not really like outraged by it, you know, they're not outraged by it. You had this plot against the governor of Michigan to kidnap her and have a trial. And, and it got like passing news. I mean, that to me would be so outrageous that how could it, anybody even think, and how can people even get away with that? I mean, th those are the stories I would like to see on TV every night saying these people are wrong, what they're doing is criminal and they should be arrested and they should be, well, I know those people, particular people were arrested, but all these other folks that are that are going out there saying this racist stuff and it, it, it just, it, it really worries me a lot in terms of 
if the ignorance of, that we have in our country is becoming so manifested that it then it becomes normal. Yeah, I, I agree, you know, that, that there's a lot of ignorance, uh, a lot of violence. Uh, it's infuriating, paralyzing at times, you know, when you consider uh, what goes on in the world. However, I mean, I don't think that it's ever been any different, quite frankly. Uh, it, I'm not trying to belittle where we are today or, or to counteract what, what Dolores has just said. I agree with her 100%. But the fact is that, um, you know, the human race has always been involved in an epical struggle, you know, between it, what we call good and evil or light and darkness. You know, the, the Mayas used to call it the struggle between Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca, you know, the, the god of light and the god of shadow and, and uh, the sun uh, as opposed to the night. Uh, but that has gone on always, you know. I, I think that uh, the earth is a garden, you know, and if you don't, if you don't weed it, it, it'll get over choked with weeds, and the weeds are the injustices that continue to grow. It calls for constant activism. So how do you keep people active? Well, I mean, my solution to the work of the teatro, you know, and, and again, this was the case of the teatro campesino emerging out of the Leno grave strike, was that what was at work was the creative power that exists in everybody. The essence of, of, of all our religions, you know, are our belief in the creator. Well, the creator is a principle that exists in our daily lives. We're all creators. We all are capable of creating. We're all artists eventually. And if we can just tap into that power that we all have, you don't need money. You don't even education, you know. Many of the people that started with the Tetra Camcino couldn't even read and write, but they became genius actors. You know, Felipe Cantu, well, well, he could read and write, but Felipe Cantu was amazing. He became the godfather of Chicano theater, as far as I'm concerned, because he was a prototype. He set the, the, the template, you know, and so he came straight out of the fields. He was in Delano. He had seven children. He was from Mexico. He was an immigrant. But nevertheless, he was fantastic. And anybody that ever saw him perform, I think, was privileged to see a great artist. But in any case, everybody is an artist. And you can't take that away from the poor. You can't take that away from people of color. You can't take that away from women. You can't take that away from kids. They have it. So my, my uh, journey as an activist, as an actor activist, has been to expose people to the power that exists in their own imaginations, in their own hands, in their own voices, that they can sing, they can dance. And you can do this, you know, anywhere. You can do this out in the open, in the fields. The uh, Teatro Campesino started out on the picket line, out in the middle of the San Joaquin Valley without a cent. You know, we didn't need money. What we needed was the spirit of the people. This is why we, tacked, we it was tapped into the spirit of the huelga. And yes, it comes and goes. And a lot of that spirit has been dissipated. I agree with Dolores. It's just it's heartening sometimes to see that the young people aren't as tapped into it. But then again, it's a wave. You know, it comes and goes. And so we need to prepare for the next wave. And the wave is coming. The wave is with us, and it'll be powered by the creativity of this whole new generation and all the old people that can still create. We're not gone yet. You know, we're still here. Dolores is 90 years old. God bless her. You know, she's still creative. She's still inspiring. This is wonderful. We need to see this. You know, I'm 80 myself, you know. But, but the thing is that we need to continue and pass the hat, pass the torch, pass the hat, yeah, pass the hat and pass the <laughs> torch to the next generation so that we can empower ourselves to the power that the creator has instilled in every last one of us. But I think that, that uh, you know, cultivating that power, I think this is what uh, somehow we need to do. And I know, and, and when I when I sound a little um, uh, depressed about this, uh, it's because you think that it, this, like you say, at least that this has always been the good and evil, you know, uh, the yin and the yang, whatever. But uh, the thing is that now that uh, the humanity has, we have developed it's uh, it's at such a high level uh, in terms of agriculture, in terms of technology, you know, like we have everything at our fingertips, uh, you, so to speak, that we could really have a world, uh, and we know we have a global economy. Uh, we have a global planet where everybody is uh, more connected than ever before. That at this point, uh, the push would be uh, to you know make the world make the world safe for everybody, uh, make the world safe, make the, everybody that could be fed, everybody that could be sheltered, and that would seem to be our goal. Instead of uh, and Lee did mention this, the whole profit motive uh, that keeps this from happening. 
you know, the profit and the greed and, and the accumulation of wealth, like here in the United States, where you have 10% of the corporations and the wealthy families that have 90% of the wealth. And so uh, how do we uh, get at that? And if we, if we could have a, uh, maybe a couple of thousand Tato Campesinos <laughs> around the country uh, speaking to people's hearts and, and their consciousness uh, in, in terms of uh, making them understand that, yeah, we do have the power to change this. And I know right now we have to use the electoral process. And of course, we're going to see that in, in just a few more days. But, you know, thinking of, uh, of how, how it, would, it would seem that with everything that we have at our fingertips right now as a human race, that we could eliminate poverty, that we could eliminate, el eliminate ignorance uh, at this point in time. And so that that is what, what I like to think about, that we could make this happen. It's doable, but we've got to have uh, the people in the organizations to make this happen. And I know there's a lot of people out there that are doing, uh, you know, taking this on in, in, different, in different ways. Uh, but to think about how can we do it maybe in a faster way. Well, you know, one of the things we talk about social justice and, and justice itself, we need to, I like to study words, you know, the, the origin of words. And justice is really a question of balance. You know, you adjust, you balance something. And what we're really looking at is the need for a natural balance. I think that uh, uh, we're up against uh, a, a new foe here. We're in the middle of a war and people don't even know it. Except it's the planet Earth who has declared war on the human race. And, and a lot of people don't realize that. They think it's between human beings. We're so arrogant, we think that uh, we can carry on the way we used to. Uh, once we got to nuclear weapons, the nature of war did change. There hasn't been a world war because there can't be. We'll wipe ourselves out with nuclear weapons. But we still keep on destroying the planet, you know, by, uh, by sending air, airplanes all over the world you know, every second. They're, they're chewing up the, the, the to, to fracking, chewing up the earth itself, you know, just in order to burn fossil fuels. But the fact is that the earth is not putting up with it. Mother Earth is alive. She's alive. And she's putting, she's saying, okay, you, you so-and-sos, I've had it with you guys. And so what she has launched is a, is a virus, a tiny little virus that no one can defend against. And, and the thing is that we've lost over, you know, almost going on 250,000 people, you know, in this country. Uh, we're getting there very quickly. Millions of people all over the earth have got it. And, and the fact is that we're going to keep on dying until we learn our lessons, you know. Uh, el chingazo a visa, as we used to say, you know, among the campesinos. <laughs> the, 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 the trancaso uh, teaches us, you know. It takes the pain of, of direct experience in order to learn. And, and we're like burros, you know, because we, have, we need kicks in order to understand. And Mother Earth is kicking us in the behind and saying, get smart. You can't keep on living the way that you're living and destroying the earth for the sake of profit. What is profit? Profit is nothing. If we don't have a planet to live on, it doesn't matter how rich you are. We're all going down with the ship. So the fact is that these, we're looking for justice in the world. We need to find natural balance. We need to get good with Mother Nature. And of course, Cesar long ago pointed out what the pesticides were doing to the earth in California. We were poisoning the earth. And I mean, anytime you can go out and walk into the fields and you can feel that impact of poison. I've been there myself. And, and we used to do that just in the Huelga, go out and, and we could smell the pesticides in the fields. And, and of course, the farm workers were the first ones. They were the canaries in the mine that were telling us, you know, we're poisoning ourselves. The whole planet is being poisoned. So I, I think that is a question of environmental justice as well. That, that Mother Earth is part of, of the voice of the creator saying, straighten out, people, straighten out, or you won't, or your California will be on fire, you know, 12 months a year, 24-7, and, and there will be no place to live, and the, oh, the rest of the planet will be flooded. Florida is going underwater. The fact is that the writing is on the wall. It's right before us. Every new generation needs to see this and take this seriously. Justice is a question of natural balance as much as it is a balance between society and human beings. Thank you for both for these inspiring words. Um, I want to remind everybody you have the opportunity tonight to talk to these legendary leaders by submitting your comments and um, thoughts, questions, quejas in the uh, comments or chats. And we'll happily share these with our, 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 our speakers tonight. Um, I actually wanted to ask both of you, this is certainly a historic election, uh, more so I think than, than many. We always talk about elections being historic, but I can't imagine anybody who's watching tonight not feeling the gravity of this moment. 
But as people like Stacey Abrams have have told us, voting and 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 the political process is not just a single act, right? It is a process. And these issues aren't one and done. You can't just elect one person and yeah, it's done, right? We have justice. So looking beyond just November 3rd, looking beyond just this election, hoping that we have at least some new administration, whatever that looks like, um, what do you hope are the priorities? What do you what do you hope gets taken up right away? What do you hope to see at least in terms of tangible changes in the months, if not years ahead? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, we know we know what some of Biden's platforms are. You know, he's definitely wants to go for and, and health care, of course, has got, got to be number one uh, to see how we can defend ourselves from from the virus, of course. And we know that there are many, many people in this country that do not have health care. In California, we're luckier than most, even though our undocumented people are, are only covered up to the age of 26 years old. But there are many, many places throughout the country that the people have zero health care. And that, of course, is going to be one of his priorities. He's also talking about education, uh, making it easier for people to go to college, et cetera. Those are important issues. But, uh, the, but the bigger question, I think, and this is, I guess, what really bothers me, is that we know that the, again, who who the, the people that, that are really controlling the government, again, are these corporations that have all of the wealth, and again, we would talk about about the the environment and people that are out there uh, with the a fossil fuel industry. Uh, you know, they're they're not going to let go very easily, even though they themselves know. Like I guess it came out with Exxon that they understood what was going on, uh, but they, you know, they still are ignoring that. And, and, and somehow we've got to, uh, to start attacking the whole profit system. And people talk about socialism and, and, you know, all of a sudden socialism is this big nasty word when people don't even know what the heck it is, you know? And then you have countries in Scandinavia and Europe that are socialist countries, uh, socialist democratic countries. You have Cuba, uh, you know, where you people have free health care, have free education. And, uh, and it's a little teeny country that has an economic boycott uh, it gets, you know, a boycott by the United States of America. And yet they're able to provide free health care, free education for every every single person in Cuba. And, and people can even buy their own homes in Cuba. You know, so, uh, so, so I think our political system needs to be, uh, let, let me put it this way. Uh, Luisa mentioned the capitalistic system early on. And they say that in the United States, we have a brutal, brutal capitalistic system. It is brutal. Uh, it, it is. It, it doesn't it care about anybody. You know the profit motive is high, and uh, and so I think somehow this has got to be attacked. And I don't know how it's going to happen, uh, but I think it, it's some. We have to figure out how, how that is going to happen. When I think about the martyrs, I think of Robert Kennedy. I think of John Kennedy, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, and even Malcolm X. We know that these leaders were were assassinated. Okay. And we know who assess we know who killed them. The question we never asked is who ordered them to be killed? You know, who ordered them to be killed? And so I think that somehow we have got to, the way that racism is right now in the forefront, sexism is in the forefront, then I think somehow we've also, the environment is in the forefront right now, we're all talking about that. Then something, the conversation has got to go deeper and say these billionaires uh, these uh, that are controlling our government. And I, I like to quote Jose Ortega y Gasset, who was a, a Spanish philosopher in Spain, who said, when you have, well, number one, he said, if you do not have an educated citizenry, the the corrupt and the greedy will control a government, will, will control a government. And Robert Kennedy Jr. said this, and I loved his words. He said, when you have, when you have a, uh, the, the, well, when you have corporations that control a government, he said, you have fascism. When you have workers that control the government, then you have socialism. So, uh, and I think that's something that the American public is not ready yet for that conversation against, because again, it's a lack of education, but I think people, we need to have that conversation. Well, I think, I mean, it is important, uh, most definitely that, uh, that people educate themselves with respect to what the realities are of a representative democracy and what it takes. I remember uh, when I first got to college, it was back in 1958, one of the first things that I did was I joined the civil rights movement. I was very impressed by young African-American activists and organizers 
because of their political smarts. I said, man, these people are very aware. You know, these young people are very aware. I was a young person myself. They're very aware of what's happening, you know, and I want to be, I want to be as smart as they are. I want to be as, as, as into the process as they are in terms of making social change happen through this system. And uh, once I discovered uh, the, that uh, the union was organizing in Delano, I encountered two very inspiring leaders, Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, who started by registering voters. And they were activists in the field. I was always impressed with Dolores' trip to Sacramento, lobbying people. She became, of course, our chief lobbyist within the union movement. I mean, this is political smarts, you know? This is, this is the kind of political smarts that more people need to have. They need to know how the system works. Now, there's no denying that corporations have a tremendous, too much power, then that, then that too much wealth is, is concentrated in too few individuals, the 1%. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. But uh, we have to continue to work. We have to be realistic in terms of what this country is. You know, sometimes our ideals get uh, run away with us. You know, the, the, I was very inspired by the Mexican Revolution, but it took me years to realize I was not in Mexico. I was in the United States of America, you know. <laughs> and so I had to deal with the politics of this country. I had to deal with the structures of this country. And young people need to know. Yes, there are all kinds of shenanigans going on in Washington. Mitch McConnell, you know, no lo puedo ver ni pin por cabrón. You know, he's, he is like a criminal as far as I'm concerned, what he has done to subvert the real meaning of the Senate. But the Senate obviously is a seat of power, and we need to get our representatives into the Senate. It's one of the hot spots, you know, even more than the House of Representatives. And here we are uh, uh, in California, a state of 40 million people, and we have as many senators as South Dakota has, you know, as North mm -hmm. Dakota. And mm -hmm. this is ridiculous. This was uh, not seen by the forefathers, the founding fathers of this country. It is an adjustment that needs to be made in the near future, but we won't make it unless more people get involved. My advice to the young people is study your country, learn how the politics work, but also the economics. That's how I used to say economics before politics. And that's a very true lesson. We need to know where the money goes. We need to follow the money. And then I don't know what the, all these rich people are thinking or what planet they live on, but they're sinking. They're going to sink with us as much as anybody else. There won't be a planet for them to exploit if they keep this up. It is a question of continuing to pressure all the classes in the world to make social change happen. We mustn't lose our faith. We have to follow the wave principle and take the next wave and continue to change the world in behalf of the betterment of everybody. And I think what uh, what, Lisa, what Luis just uh, described is called a democracy. <laughs> and, and I, you know, when I often think about organizing, and I remember when I uh, found out that you could get people together and organize them, and then you, you could register people to vote, and you could put people in office, and I felt like I, I had found a pot at the end of the uh, a, a pot, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Uh, this is how it's done. And I'm just, I thought I was reflecting on that. And I thought, well, maybe this is what the, the founding fathers of our government, not our country, our government, uh, this is what they thought when they uh, figured out the way uh, you know, to write the constitution and to uh, figure out, out a way for that people could actually vote people into office and, and, and we could do self-government, although we know they got it from the, from the Native Americans, okay? That's where the idea came from to begin with. And, and they stole it from the, and not stole it, but they utilized it. And, uh, and that, that is, of course, the, the, the magic that, that democracy brings to us. But then we have to really make people understand what that is. And right now, a lot of people don't understand how powerful that is and how wonderful it is. And again, that's why we have to get civic education back into our schools, along with ethnic studies and, and gender studies, et cetera. And, you know, somehow for the t we, we, before kids are uh, in preschool, they've got to learn about uh, the fact that we're just one human race. And by the way, this is my mantra everywhere that I speak. And I, what I do say to everybody is that we are one human race. We are homo sapiens, one human race. We have a lot of ethnic groups, a lot of nationalities, a lot of cultures, but one human race. And our human race began in Africa, which makes all of us Africans. And so I like to say that to the neo-Nazis and the KKK and all the people out there. Get over it. You're Africans, okay? Just ya basta, ya basta. Yeah. You know, a few years ago, uh, uh, my, Lupe, my wife Lupe and I went, went to Sonora. This is like my ancestral roots are in Sonora, among the Yaquis, among others. But uh, uh, I was trying to, uh, I was doing some research on the Yaqui Easter ceremony, and I wanted to shoot some video. 
but I had to go before the council in order to to get permission. I wasn't. It's a religious ceremony. So uh, I met with the council, and they were all campesinos. I mean, they were the poorest mm -hmm. of the poor, wearing warachis. You could tell from their feet that uh, they worked in the fields. I mean, these were poor indios, yaquis. And yet they were, the dignity there and the power inherent in that group was amazing to me. I, I felt that uh, I was dealing with, with senators. You know, I was dealing with powerful people. But this is their life. This is their ceremony. This is their... Their, their village at this point is in Sonora. And, and, and so I, I, I had to give them full respect. And, and, but I was very impressed. I came away thinking, these are the roots of democracy, you know, that poor people mm -hmm. like this, that, that barely have warachis, mm -hmm. nevertheless have the power to determine the direction, you know, of, of their lives. And, and that has always stuck with me. Well, that was back in 99, it wasn't so long ago. But the thing is, that, that it made me think about my own heritage. And I'm thinking maybe this is where this, this urge, you know, toward democracy comes from. It comes from our indigenous ancestors who believed in true democracy. They believed in the common voice. They believed in common consensus, you know, that people gathered and decided, the women included, by the way, as mm -hmm. to what was good for, for the, the tribe, you know, eventually. And I think we're still learning that. The whole of, the, of humanity has to be taught you know, what the lessons of the eons, again, are, are teaching us, what our history, our culture is teaching us. I believe in history, and I believe in, in looking back at the past so that we can engage those lessons and, and incorporate them into our lives today. I advise, my advice is to young people, study your historical culture, study the history of human civilization. There are a lot of lessons there that we must all learn, even how to get through moments of despair. You know, mm -hmm. I wrote a piece years ago called the Camino Burana based on a piece of music, but it was about the Black Plague, you know, back in 1350, when uh, the Black Plague came to Europe and killed 75 million people. You know, it wiped them out. But what happened is that the plague was so universal that people stopped working. You couldn't pick up stuff. You couldn't pick up gold because it might, it might contaminate you. So what happened is that the workers started uh, valuing themselves, you know, for their skills. And out of that came guilds, out of that eventually came unions. It was out of this plague. Who knows what's gonna come out of this present plague right now? The value of human life is being reassessed right now as we live, and we are finding new ways to communicate. We're gonna use these tools to talk to each other and to formulate a new life for all of us, or we're all going down with the ship. Again, I keep coming back. That, that's the dystopian look, you know, that, that is, that is the fatalistic look that's saying the end of the world is upon us, which is always upon us. But so is hope. So is rebirth. But we need to believe. As the Mayans used to say, creer es crear. We need to believe in ourselves. We need to believe that we can make this country work for everybody. And we need to activate and uh, sacrifice if we must, but move forward. And I think uh, going back, uh, you talk a lot about uh, the indigenous people. I think going back to, to the values of the indigenous people uh, are something that we should really think about uh, because the values of the indigenous people are of respect and protecting each other and, you know, cooperating with each other and, and sharing with each other. You know, that everybody then uh, within a, a group of people that you all get, you know, whatever is there for the tribe is, uh, you know, shared by everyone. And if we can think of those values and then of course of protecting mother earth that is another big value of indigenous people. And so, and those are our beginnings, those are our roots. And so if we can go back to those roots and we never would have survived on planet earth had we not protected each other, cared for each other, shared whatever we had with each other. And those are the indigenous values that I think we have to come back to and honor those values and uh, not think of, you know, some people are better than others because they have more money than other people. You know, we have to think differently or maybe go back to our, our, our humble origins uh, before we had material goods and material things. You know, Dolores, that, that reminds me of, of the early days, you know, of the Huelga in Delano, you know. It's, again, that spirit that existed at the beginning of the grape strike. We hadn't, nobody had any money. I mean, there was no money. <laughs> and we were all eating, uh, you know, at, at Filipino Hall, you know, basically in the mess hall, you know, that thanks to the Filipinos, Eddie, uh, with Larry Etleong, you know, and, and uh, that, that invited us in. It was wonderful. But the fact is that that there was a spirit there that that's for all day, for all time. You know, it, it was inspiring to me for 
all my life has been my inspiration, but that, that you can do so much with nothing, but your mm -hmm. human spirit. People need to learn that lesson again and again, you know, it must be taught again and again. And uh, yeah, we need our toys, we need our tools, we need whatever we need, but, but you can't do it without spirit. You gotta have spirit. You gotta have that belief. That's what does it. Let, let me ask you both about about care and particularly about self-care. A lot of people are asking through comments and through chat that these are particularly challenging times for activists, for organizers. There is a lot of work to be done. And I think all of us are feeling the weight of that. For those of us and for many people who are out there who are feeling exhausted physically, emotionally, spiritually, um, what are some of the things that we can do for our self-care, both for personally, but also is in terms of their communities to both remain strong, to remain resilient, but also to remain hopeful during this time? I think you should answer that, Luis, because <laughs> I say that because uh, Luisa would be the master of keeping uh, everybody in nice spirits, that like he did with the Tato Campesino. You know, the 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 Delano grape strike went on for five years. People don't realize how how long that was, and you had people that were out there in the picket lines every single day, from the morning to really from the sun up to the sundown, and yet to keep the spirits up of people for that long to go back out there the next day and you know, be doing that picket line and seeing them more new strikers or strike breakers that were coming in to break the strike. And so Luis was able to do a phenomenal job and, and uh, you know, keeping everybody's spirits lifted. So I, I wanna hear what Luis, what Luis has to say on that. Well, I think, I mean, we need to breathe, you know, is breathe mm -hmm. in, breathe out and uh, forgive yourself, you know, don't, don't be so hard on yourself. You're human, we're all human. And, uh, you know, we, 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 are, we can't be at our best all the time. You know, the, the body needs to breathe. And, uh, and so it's, we have our ups and downs. But, you, you, again, the weight principle works for me because that's, that's what it means. You know, we're, all, we're all, uh, always waving, you know, going up and down. And, and, actually, if you really think about the nature of the human being, we exist in nine-year cycles. You know, this is coming from the Mayas. Nine was their, their number for time. But uh, in science, uh, every nine years, you know, we, we're, we're completely, uh, we have a whole new cellular structure. It means that you're born with a complete set of cells. By the time you're nine years old, every cell in your body has been replaced by new cells. And so by the time you're 18, you've gone through another change. By the time you're 27, another change. 36, another change. 45, 54, 72, and so forth. You know, 63, 4, 72. Every nine years, you change. Dolores is entering her 10th cycle. She's 90 years old, God bless her. But the thing is, look how, how vital she is. She has kept herself alive. She, she can answer this question. But the fact is that, that it comes from, again, the nine-year cycles, uh, a spiral. You know, you're moving forward. You're a serpent crawling out of your own dead skins. Every nine years, you leave a dead skin behind. Uh, people, when they're 18 years old, are going through mental change. I don't know what's happening. We're nine years old, let's say. When you're nine years old, you're going through changes. You don't know what's happening to you, but you're changing. And, and the fact is that you're starting a whole new cycle again. We come and go. We complete a cycle and start a new one. And, and we are constantly evolving in our lives. So if you know with the nature of your human nature, if you know how it is that you as a human being are an organic living being in nature, you can understand what is it that makes you tick. Why are you depressed? Why are you sad? You know, the Japanese have turned sadness into an art form. They accept mm -hmm. sadness as part of life, as part of culture. We in this country don't because we believe happiness. We've got to be happy all the time. That doesn't work. You can't be happy all the time. You know, it's in Mexico, we have a much healthier, I think, appreciation of the contradictions in human nature. You know, from Dia de los Muertos to, to the way that, you know, Viva Mexico, hijos de la tal por cual. You know what I'm saying? It, 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 and, and yet, I mean, I think we abuse it in Mexico, perhaps by too much tequila or something from time to time. You know, but the fact is that the culture is very vibrant because it deals with the contradictions within it. American culture is a lot more straightforward, straight line, hard ass. You know, and and that gets a lot of people into medical difficulties. It gets them into depression. So then they need cocaine to keep going. You know. And, and mm -hmm. cocaine is the wrong way to go. You know, the Inca said it a long time ago. The Inca, the, the Inca, the cocaine god, the coca god was going to be the destruction of the Ladino, I mean, the white man. 
Mm-hmm. And and that's part of what's happening too, is that the, the, the presence of drugs in our culture are completely reforming. So so I'd say get yourself clean if you can. You know what I'm saying? Stop smoking what you smoke, stop dropping what you drop, stop drinking what you drink. Believe in yourself, you know, believe in your own li- living vitality because that can generate new life in you and and inspire you so that you can inspire others. I take inspiration really from the flow of life. I, I don't expect to live forever. But that's all right, you know, because someone will keep on living. The human race will keep on living. I hope to live as long as Dolores is living, you know. She's well. 90 years old and going strong, you know. Mm-hmm. But the fact is that, that no one lives forever, and that's all right, too. That's fine. That's just part of the cycle. And, and we accept the cycle. We can keep on going and inspire others to live their lives as human beings, you know, and so that uh, we can all help each other to, to survive. Yeah, and my response uh, to that would be uh, to celebrate uh, victories. Uh, I think music is always very uh, uplifting. You know, our bodies are two thirds water, so music affects us when we hear when we hear music, and I think uh, that really helps us when we, we're feeling a little a little down. And like uh, Luis was saying, uh, you can't win every battle. You're going to lose some battles, and that's okay because when something doesn't go the way that you want it to, that means you just have to take a little detour and go in a different direction. And But on that journey for justice, you're meeting people, you're learning things, and even the, the people that are negative that you meet on that path, you learn something from them also. So we take everything as a lesson. Uh, you know, and if it's a, something that's negative, okay, but something that we say in Spanish, Something good always that comes out of something bad. No, no hay nada mal que algo bien no salga, you know? So if we remember <laughs> that. So regardless of how th- bad things are, something good is going to be coming out of uh, out of that negative uh, 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 event, whatever whatever's going on. And yeah, I guess yeah. having that faith, having that faith in yourself, having your, that faith in others, and, and celebrate uh, your victories, whatever they may be. Any, any ch- time you get a chance, celebrate, celebrate with music, celebrate with friends, uh, listen to comedy, and the comedy is always good because it always makes you laugh. Uh, this is what Luis. This is the way Luis uh, touched. I have to say this too: the way that Luis was able to touch the hearts and the souls of the farm workers to uh, get them to lose their fear, you know, because they were going to go out there and do some incredible things. They were going to stop working. They're going to go on marches, and, that, uh, and they're doing this without knowing where the next meal is coming from. Uh, but he did it with comedy. And when people have comedy, then they laugh and they laugh at others. They laugh at themselves, and and it kind of it it kind of breaks down uh, those uh, the fear that people have, whether it's fear uh, inhibitions or whether it's fear of the future. And it kind of uh, the comedy, I think, in itself brings brings people hope and life. Yeah, that reminds me. It's a Mayan word for work. You know, the Maya Yucateco word for work is menya, and men means creer es crear. You know, to believe is to create. To create is to believe. To create, to believe, to do. And then the ya is love and pain. If you feel love, you're going to feel pain. If you feel pain, it's because you feel love. So to believe, to create, to do with love and pain, that's the Mayan definition of work. Now, it, it's not slave labor. You know, It's not wage slave labor. It is creative work because we're all creators in that sense. Uh, I, I love our community. Pre- this is, the for me, the heart of the work of the Teatro Campesinos when we have our community shows in which little kids as young as three and four years old, some of them in their mother's arms, can participate in the show. They come in as little danzantes or whatever. And, and people in their 80s you know, and 90s can participate also at the other end of the scale. It's all one human continuum. And, and that's where the joy comes, Dolores. And, and the humor certainly is, uh, is absolutely why I, I salute Felipe Cantu you know, and, and Aguilera and all of the people that helped to create the, the original Teatro Campesino because... These were brave souls, you know, in the face of uh, a lot of danger and, and a lot of despair. But, uh, you know, our, our, our weapon was, yes, to make people laugh and sing. And, and if when you're singing, even when you're facing goons on the picket line, and, and I've seen this many times, if people, women, men, children out there singing, it gives you an, an immense power, you know, that, that overcomes the fear that, that can topple you. So, uh, there's uh, someone else said it along with uh, I, I, well, Pete Seeger said it at one point, but he's got it from somewhere else. Beware of the movement that sings. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And, and the Welga movement began to sing early on, even before I got there, it was singing. And so it, it, it's amazing to me 
the power of music. Yes, Dolores, you're absolutely right. Power of music, the power of art to transform our lives in, in the context of a social struggle. I love that. Um, we've got a question from Facebook. Um, I am an educator at Luis Valdez Leadership Academy. Um, what is the most important thing to teach our youth of color as they navigate through educational systems that were not built for them? Well, I guess it's for me, huh? <laughs> yeah. I, for both of you, certainly okay, for both Dolores, of you. Yeah, give it a crack, Dolores. Well, um, yeah, we have to teach our youth uh, to believe in themselves, uh, to realize that they are going to face racism in the classroom, uh, especially right now. Do you know that in the, all of the United States of America, the, and even though we are becoming, uh, you know, a browner country, you know, a black and brown, a growing Asian, uh, that we, of, of all of the teachers in the United States, you know how many are Latinos? 2%. Mm -hmm. 2%. And, and we know that these kids, when they go in the classroom, that they're not respected, they're not taught their history. If they had Luis as a teacher to teach them all these wonderful things about, you know, their, their, their ancestors and the wonderful things that they did would give them that dignity that they, that they, that they deserve. Uh, they're not taught about the contributions of, of people of color to the United States of America. And unless we start really working really hard to get this into our classroom, our kids are so handicapped. So that means that we've got to go outside of the classroom and be able to teach them, uh, to teach them what they need to know. Number one is to have faith in themselves, do not listen to teachers and that look down on them or discourage them or tell them, you know, you're not college material. How many kids are told that? So many kids. In our foundation, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, uh, we have a, a very big youth, youth organization. And to see the kids develop, I mean, it is so amazing where we have young people that before could, couldn't even talk. Couldn't, and now to see them give these, these glowing speeches, it's just, it's just amazing. This is the same kid, the farmer kid, you know, and, and they couldn't hardly you know, say anything in public and then they give up. So we know that, that all of our young people can be developed. We just gotta find ways to, uh, to be able to make it bigger and wider. And, and so our kids can, can have a dignity and faith in themselves and not listen to the people that are putting them down. I mean, this is, this is, this is our, our challenge that we have uh, until we can change the whole educational system, which we, it has to be changed because our system is totally rigged against kids of color. In our foundation, we actually sued the Kern High School District because they expelled 2,100 kids, 2,100 kids in a year, black and brown young people. And of all of those that they, that they expelled, only about 10% even merited any kind of a suspension, let, let alone an expulsion. So from 2,100 expulsions, we got it down to 21. Wow. But still, the Kern High School District, as part of the lawsuit, they were supposed to have Hispanic Heritage Month, never happened. They were supposed to have Black History Month, never happened. So we're going back into court in December, and uh, because they're still into uh, the court, uh, you know, uh, the decision that they had. And uh, guess what? The teachers, 80% of the teachers in the Kern High School District are Anglo, you know, and, and uh, they come from where? They recruit from Arkansas, Oklahoma, and all of these places where you don't have kids of color. So, and this is typical. This is not just Kern County, Bakersfield, California. This is the state of Cal. This is the whole rural valley of the San Joaquin Valley of, Cal of California. It's New Mexico, it's Arizona, it's Texas, it's New York State, it's Florida, everywhere. The kids of color are not getting the equitable education that they deserve. And this is one of the big fights that we have ahead of us. I think, I mean, we have to educate the educators. That, that's, uh, it's, it's been a struggle. Um, I, uh, I was invited to teach a class uh, for the Experimental College at Fresno State in 1968. Uh, it was in January of 68. And I uh, ended up teaching a class called La Raza, which became La Raza Studies. It was uh, probably the first Chicano Studies uh, uh, Institute, you know, in, in uh, department rather, in, in the CSU system. Although others came up real quick. But in any case, uh, the, the fact is that we realized right away that, that we had to really challenge the whole system, you know, because they didn't consider that our approach to history, they call it historical revisionism. You know, we were just trying to include ourselves in American history. And to this day, it, with the shenanigans in Arizona, it's the same way. I mean, they're trying to wipe out, they're burning books over there, you know, that, including mine, in, in order to try to eliminate that memory. But listen, it's not going to work. 
it's not going to work. The, inher the historical imperative is too huge. And I mean, I have made a life study of the Mayan culture. I've got a new book coming out that deals with the principles of, of Mayan culture that we can apply in our lives. Uh, but it's coming out of London. But the thing is that, they, it, you know, it, if we don't take an interest in our own history, nobody else will. And that doesn't mean that ours is any more important than anybody else's. It just means that ours is also there and it's part of human history and it needs to be integrated, you know, into a heavy balance, into a balance of, of the world cultures. And, and uh, we need to speak for the indigenous. And so we need to educate the educators. And those that are going through the educational system know, going through the system now, need to know that they need to teach others. You know, we need to help each other, you know. We need to pass the torch. And that is how we will begin to uh, change the system. What is called ethnic studies should really be part of American studies. We should study America as a whole. You know, black history, uh, Native American history, Filipino history, Asian American history, Mexican American, all of that is American history. It isn't just, you know, Northern European, uh, uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant history is American history. It's everybody, it's all of us. It's continental. It was one of the joys of my life to be able to go to Mexico and direct the world premiere of Zoot Suit in Spanish. You know, I mean, I was integrated into Mexican culture. It was voted the best Mexican musical of the year, <laughs> okay, by the Mexico City critics. And and again, I was speaking for Chicanos, but it turns out that I was speaking for Mexicanos as well. So we eliminated that border, you know. The border did not cross us, you know. We, we, we opened it up. We opened it up for all of us. Did we lose our, <laughs> our hostess? <laughs> Hello, Dolores, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you. Well, yeah. I don't know where our hostess went, but uh, we I'm are here. For, I'm looking forward to your book, Luis. Okay, yeah, it's called uh, Theater of the Sphere, The Vibrant Being. Wonderful. Yeah, it's, uh, we've had, a, we've had a, a hell of a time uh, putting it together. It's been, it's been our savior, actually, during this time of the pandemic. You know, it's give, given us something to focus on. So it, it's the only way to go. And there's Father O'Brien. Hello. Uh, I'm not sure what happened to uh, to Anna, but it's really wonderful uh, to hear this conversation. I, here's a we're coming to the end of our hour, and it's really uh, uh, been delightful. So thank you so much. Um, I a question from uh, from Facebook: uh, When will we see our first Latino president? What's and why is it what's taking so long? <laughs> It depends on what you mean by Latino, you know. Again, Latino comes in many different shades and forms. If you're talking about our first indigenous president, maybe that, 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 you know, that, that, that's the real question here. Uh, because I, I suspect there already have been pre presidents that have Spanish blood in them, you know. It, that's not so odd. That, that they, they were conquistadores, so it was not so hard to think of them as pre presidents of the United States. But in any case, if you're talking about the indígena president, uh, it shouldn't be that long. You know, uh, one of the things that impresses yeah. me about about the uh, uh, the Castro brothers, you know, the, the, the magic twins, I call them the magic twins, going back to Mayan philosophy, is that they're, 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 they're both vibrant human beings and vibrant politicians. You know, I, I, I had dinner uh, with uh, with Rosie, the mother of the two twins, and and uh, and Joaquin, you know, uh, uh, Cortez, you know, uh, I mean, Castro. Uh, and uh, the fact is that I was impressed with, and I met them both. I met them both at the White House. They, they, they're, tr they're extremely articulate. They're intelligent. I mean, not any more than one would expect, you know, from someone that's gone to school and been educated, as they both have. But they, they're really speaking from a new place, you know, in the American mentality. And there are more right behind them. There are many more that are right beside them. And uh, mm -hmm. among them is uh, male or female, one of the, the first Latino or Latina presidents uh, of the United States. It, uh, and it'll be high time because this would also be a Native American president. That's really what the question is. When mm -hmm. do we get the first Native American president <laughs> that represents the continent as a whole? And, mm -hmm. and it, it takes a lot of people. I know where I come from. I mean, I'm dealing with my own thought. But it's taken 500 years to give me this opportunity to be able to do this, to read books and to, to read about uh, my ancestors and to be able to translate these ideas into a, a language that makes sense in the 21st century in this world context, you know, without insulting anybody. 
I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian by faith because I was I was raised a Christian. But I mean, my interpretation of, of the application of Jesus Christ to our world is a little bit different, I think, than 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 some people. You know, uh, I believe in in the poor guy, the guy that went out among the poor, the guy that went out there and dug ditches. I believe in that guy. I believe in that Jesus, not 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 the one that uh, that uh, helps uh, self uh, adulating. Uh, ministers become rich you know by by extracting the money from the poor and the fact is that that uh the whole farm workers movement was based on the image of the worker christ and i think that if we can just go back to that you know the world will be a much better place for uh, everybody wow that's a yeah, thank you for that uh so and i just filled in for you while you got disconnected but i think we're just about to wrap up so i'll let you do that anna <laughs> Thank you. I apologize to everyone. This is the life we live now where, no. you know, <laughs> yes, technology dependent. Um, with that thought in mind, we're sort of coming to an end. We've got seven days to a major election. I want to ask our esteemed speakers, are there any other thoughts, any words of wisdom, any other consejo that you can provide to the folks that are listening to anybody here tonight? Well, I, I would just like to say that, uh, uh, you know, if you haven't voted, please vote. And uh, uh, we're working really hard on some propositions that are very important. And I guess this is where some of uh, my thinking comes from. Uh, we have Proposition 15, which will bring in $12 million into uh, $12 billion into our school system. Uh, well, school system and communities. We have uh, Proposition 16 uh, to bring back affirmative action that Pete Wilson took away from us. Uh, then we have some other propositions that are that uh, a Proposition 21 for rent control, and we have uh, a, a Proposition 22, which is a you know the one for the Uber and Lyft drivers that they're uh, they're trying to uh, say that they are contract workers, and I think that's the one that scares me in some ways the most, even though the other ones do, uh, because the the millions and millions of dollars that they are putting in. Uh, to to say that these drivers of Lyft and Uber should not be covered by labor laws, you know that this is slavery in another form, and 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 you see the fast food workers, and and you see the people that work at Walmart that uh, you know they they can't get forty hours of work because and they, can't, they because they would get health benefits. This idea that this slave this kind of slavery is existing right now, and that people are accepting it. And the people will spend all of these jillions of dollars uh, to keep to keep people poor. I mean, this to me is so bothersome, and yet it's all very quote unquote legit what they're doing. So, uh, I guess this is where I started uh, the conversation at the beginning, and kind of that's where I'm ending the conversation now. So we just want to say to people, please get out there and vote if you haven't voted, and please vote yes on 15, 16, 17. <laughs> And uh, vote no on 22. That is the, the one that wants to keep the drivers in, in, in semi-slavery. And please vote. It's a, this is, I, oh, I've been telling students out there, the students, that, you know, you should, if you haven't uh, journaled before, you should do it now because you are living in a critical moment in history in the United States of America. And five years from today, or maybe 10 years from today, you're going to look back and you're going to say, I was there, I lived that time, and this is what I did to make a difference. And so we want to invite everybody, uh, join the social justice, racial justice movement, okay? Because we need everybody right now uh, so our movement can grow, our peace movement can grow, and we can make it all a better world for everybody. Si se puede. Si se puede, I want to echo that. Uh, Dolores, yes, absolutely encourage everybody to vote young people uh it's it's uh i think it's still safe to use the mail in california but uh you know they're warning that uh with a week to go it's better to go to a dropbox or to go directly to the polls you know i voted already my my wife and i voted by dropbox but uh also we checked up you know we checked up to make sure our vote got through and yes it's been counted uh, uh finally I, what i do is i want to thank the university of santa clara uh not, not just because uh, it's my alma mater in that sense <laughs> but also because uh, it was the first institute of learning in California. A lot of people don't know that. This was the first higher uh, uh, institute of higher education. It was put together, of course, there with the mission and the mission fathers and the Jesuits. But uh, it, it, was, uh, it was unique and continues to be unique, especially by sponsoring these kinds of dialogues. It is important that we talk to each other. 
through Zoom or whatever means are necessary. But the fact is that the conversation continues. The spirit of enlightenment continues. It's a struggle. It's hard to fight against the darkness, but let's light candles, you know, instead of cursing the dark, let's make light. Uh, um, Flores Magón, Ricardo Flores Magón, who died in Leavenworth Prison during World War I for protesting World War I, he, he died on a hunger strike, uh, it, it said something very interesting. He said, we must die like suns, giving off light. Mm. And that, I think, is a lesson for all of us to follow. That is beautiful. I want to ditto that. I also want to say that I know that the Jesuits have always been very famous exactly for that reason for questioning ideas and uh you know not not being afraid uh, to go out there and have these uh these conversations that are difficult and uh you might say a questionable in some people's eyes uh but that courage uh to go out there and say ask, ask the difficult questions and then look for the difficult answers so i also want to thank you very much for inviting me to speak here tonight thank you and to, and to all of the audience that is as it that was hearing us i guess we didn't give you a lot of time to ask to ask the questions but thank you very much for joining us this evening thank you thank you thank you to both of you i can't tell you the kind of spirit and and hope and inspiration and just uh, gratitude i have to talk to you but also to continue to learn from your wisdom Thank you to Father O'Brien and to everyone tonight. Um, thank you to everybody watching and who's going to continue to watch for the speakers that come. Um, we hope everyone stays safe and healthy. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Vote, 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 vote. <laughs> and remember, you've got the power. The people have the power, okay? I mean, if we were all together right now, I would, I would ask you that question, who's got the power? And you would answer me, we've got the power. And when I say what kind of power, you would say people power. Let's never forget that. And we're going to go out there, uh, you know, build up this social justice movement, make it as strong as we can, because at the end of the day, the people have the power. Si se puede. Si se puede. <laughs>